Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 3DR webinar in partnership with Kim Lee Horn. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, as the title suggests, we'll be focusing on planning phases of using drone imagery to create a design surface. We'll get started first with a, a welcome and an introduction to your speakers today. We'll go through the introduction to Red Rock Scanning Project, which is a proof of concept in partnership with 3DR, Kim Lee Horn, and Autodesk. We'll talk about some of the inefficiencies with the current workflows for the planning phases of engineering projects. And then we'll talk about using SiteScan and go through a video demo of the product. Lastly, we'll talk about turning drone imagery into design surface, so we'll do a technical walkthrough of a how to do that. And then finally, uh, Bobby will share a little bit more about what are the next steps of the Red Rocks project. So here are your speakers. First, we have Bobby Valentine, who's the firm-wide project visualization lead for Kim Lee Horn. Then we have John Heiberger, who's an engineer and project manager with Kim Lee Horn. Both Bobby and John are on the line today, and they're coming out of the Colorado office. Um, and then myself, Lauren Burke, I am a product marketer at 3D Robotics. So we'll get kicked off with Bobby, who's going to tell us a little bit more about why Red Rock. So hello, and thank you for uh, joining us today. We're super excited about this project and its results, and hope you get some great takeaways from this webinar. Um, so I'll jump right in. Why Red Rocks? Um, let's face it, it's really a cool place. Um, and, it, and it posed some very unique challenges because of its natural and man-made features. Um, it's the largest natural amphitheater in the United States, and its popularity has grown over the years. And I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the site, but if you're not, I'm going to give you a little short background of the park and the amphitheater and how we got engaged in the use of UAV technology at the park. So in 2016, the amphitheater celebrated its 75th year in operation and most recently became a national historic landmark. So there were all sorts, the planets were aligning for this to happen. Um, since 1947, the amphitheater has had a regular concert season hosting some of the most famous bands in the world from the Beatles in 1964, the Grateful Dead in 78, and probably most notably to this demographic in 1983, U2 recorded Under the Blood Red Sky, the video that was played and played and played on MTV over and over again. <laughs> um, in 2013, we were asked to perform a photo recon mission in and around the rock formations in the vicinity of the amphitheater to do two things. One, to capture and replicate photography taken about 80 years ago for the Department of the Interior for historical archiving. Um, and two, to perform visual assessments of inaccessible areas, rock formations, caves, um, to specifically look for vandalism, graffiti, trail erosion from some of the recent storms. All of this information was included in a comprehensive report delivered to the Department of Interior. Um, there's a couple slides. This is a picture of some of the photo recon that we did on the Severed and Ladders formation. And you can kind of see underneath in some of the shadows where some of the graffiti was occurring. <clears throat> and then in the next slide, we show some of the land-based LIDAR stuff we did with in conjunction with Autodesk. But um, that pertains to when we revisited the site in 2013 and 2015 using a combination of UAV technology and land-based LIDAR to experiment with different techniques to combine the two different sources. Um, we spent about three days scanning 150 acres with the UAVs and several months post-processing the data with no real workflow to go by. Um, so in 2016, I met with Dan McKinnon of 3DR at the Real Conference in San Francisco where I brought up what we were doing at Red Rocks with Autodesk. And soon thereafter, Dan came out to Denver to discuss the latest that they had to offer in the UAV marketplace with the application of their solo drone and the new site scan software. And in short, the capability of this package was mind-blowing to say the least, and I immediately contacted the city and county of Denver Parks and Rec and pitched the idea of visiting one more time to scan 150 acres of the park. And they graciously, graciously accepted, and we began our flight planning the following week 
only this time we had the capability of doing it in one day, which they were really happy about because this was right in the middle of their concert season. And to be in and out of there in one day was very important to them. So what you'll see today is a small sampling of the data set. And at this point in time, we are primarily focusing on establishing a workflow, and our presentation will reflect that. So with that little bit of history, I'm going to pass this off to John Heiberger for some of the technicalities. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Um, so as Bobby kind of alluded to in his introduction, we are very excited about this project. Um, it's been a very good opportunity for us to partner with uh, 3DR and with Autodesk to go out and um, produce a, a data set of a very high profile and um, very cool um, landmark. And um, hopefully out of that work, we will today in the webinar demonstrate a useful workflow to utilize that data set um, in a design or preliminary engineering setting. Um, so to kick us off on that foot, I wanted to first dive into uh, a little bit of background here. The, there, one of the issues for the City and County of Denver, Red Rocks Park, is the infrastructure. Um, there are some deteriorating roads, and as you can see in the photo, a lot of the parking lots are just gravel parking lots. Um, and then along with that, there aren't a lot of sidewalks throughout the park, um, so there, there will likely be some upcoming projects uh, to do improvements to pave some of the parking lots, add sidewalks, and so forth. Um, and a lot of those things are becoming important as the capacity grows and as more and more people start to visit the park and it becomes a more popular place uh, to attend concerts and other events. So as we get into the preliminary engineering or preliminary design and due diligence phases of a project, we want to be able to uh, conduct some due diligence to understand the scope and fee that might be associated with doing that project. And what we're going to do today is try to focus in on a specific use case of uh, collecting data for a preliminary design on a parking lot, one of the parking lots within the park. So moving on from there, uh, one of the next things that we wanted to talk about is in the due diligence phase or in a preliminary engineering sketch plan phase, a lot of times what we're doing in our workflow and workflows do tend to differ. So some of you in the audience might um, might relate in a little bit different way because you follow a different workflow, but we're just going to use this as an example where um, in this particular instance, it, it would be beneficial for us to be able to go out and collect best available information on the existing conditions of the gravel parking lot that we're going to focus on. And in the preliminary design phase, a lot of times what we're doing is we're gathering that data from things like an on-site site visit, maybe from Google Earth, maybe from Eagle View, or some of you might um, know as Pictometry Online, um, from other publicly available databases, such as in Colorado, there's the DRCOG Regional Data Catalog. Uh, maybe we're getting data from the USTS. Um, it just all depends. And although a lot of this data, take Google Earth as an example, is pretty good these days, a lot of times it's still not always up to date. And so anytime that we can get current data in, in the case of a drone workflow, perhaps even within the same day um, as starting a preliminary design, anytime we can get that, that current data without a major expense or time commitment, the better off we're going to be in doing a preliminary design or preliminary layout on a site. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the next slide, but what we're trying to find here a lot of times is high-resolution imagery, contours, but also um, identify surface features a lot of times. So geologic features on the surface, maybe utilities, things like that. And with a lot of the available imagery, it is fairly high-resolution, but sometimes those things are missed. So consequences of low-quality data or maybe even, you could say, limited data. Um, scoping mistakes. So first of all, in the early stages of a project, surface features might be missed or unseen or simply misplaced based on the best available information when you start to lay out CAD files and do a preliminary design. So as I said, anytime you have current data, the better off you're going to be. 
Um, when you, if you do end up having mistakes in your scope um, between your initial um, design and when, say, final detail design might take off, that ultimately leads into cutting down on design margins, um, fees, things like that, due to errors in the scoping. And then also, repeat work is a big one. Um, a lot of times, you might not have a full survey of a site early on in a project. And so, if you're able to get current data that is as close to what a final design survey might show, um, the better off you're going to be. And the less rework you would have to do uh, in, in the future once the project goes into the final design. So in that sense, we're really looking at collecting drone data as an augmentation or as a means to supplement the final um, design survey, which might come later on in the project. And so, as, a, as an example, um, you saw those two photos there. On the top was the, the uh, re reality photo that was taken from video, and we compared that to the quality of uh, images that we can get from, uh, from reality capture. Um, moving on, we just wanted to point out perhaps the differences between a traditional workflow or an example of a traditional workflow and the drone um, workflow that we're presenting here today. A lot of times we'll get a request from a client. It might take one to two days to coordinate with a subconsultant who might be going out to do the survey if we're not doing it in-house. Um, it'll take typically a week um, to do some data collection processing and overall uh, two to three weeks probably to get us to a final deliverable where we would have a PDF of a survey, we'd have associated CAD files and contour data um, that we could then bring into the tools we use every day, such as Autodesk Civil 3D, and, um, and start a preliminary design from there. Compare that on the right to um, the drone process where we would get that request from a client, perhaps in the same day or within a day we would be able to mobilize to the site um, and fly the drone, collect data, land the drone, and as soon as you're then able to land you can, and connect to the internet, upload the data to the cloud and begin processing to perhaps complete a, a preliminary design workflow of drone data to working CAD file all within a matter of one to two days. Um, and again, in no way are we proposing to replace uh, traditional survey workflow because ultimately you will need survey for final design. This is just an example of a useful workflow, especially in the preliminary design um, concept due diligence, due diligence phase of a project. So moving on from there, um, we wanted to point out a couple of considerations related to drone data because obviously there is a lot of question as far as accuracy of data and so forth. And we want to focus on the factors that might play into um, accuracy of drone data. One of those, obviously, is ground sampling distance. And it's interesting because when you start talk talking about ground sampling distance, on the 3DR Solo that we have been using, for example, there are two different lens options, um, a 20 millimeter lens and a 16 millimeter lens. Typically, with a 20 millimeter lens, we're seeing a ground sampling distance of 0.8 centimeters per pixel at 100 feet, um, 1.6 centimeters per pixel at 200 feet. So the, the ground sampling distance has improved substantially, um, even just in the last couple of years, to a point where um, the technology is, has really advanced. Obviously, camera sensor also plays into it. The light distance to the object plays into accuracy. Um, and then you can do things like include ground, ground control points to improve the accuracy. Um, on this particular Red Rocks project, we were fortunate enough to be able to go out and collect both terrestrial LIDAR data and uh, aerial drone data. And kind of one of our goals was to combine them together and, pr and produce a model based on both sources of data. One of the things I want to point out too as it relates to accuracy of data is we are in no way promoting um, replacement of traditional survey. Um, this is all about, in the way that we see the use of this technology in design, 
is use it in as a proof of concept in preliminary design and due diligence and in, in tandem with survey data, not drone in lieu of survey data. Just want to make that point. It's a very, very important point. Um, and of course, what has kind of made this all possible is the Autodesk and 3DR workflow um, that now allows designers, engineers to gather data early on in a process with little time expense and get that data processed through the cloud and into a working um, surface inside of the tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis already, namely Civil 3D. So with that, I wanted to kind of pass the baton off to Lauren and uh, she'll talk a little bit more about SiteScan. Yeah, so as, um, as John was saying, um, in this scenario for the design process, that's really the sweet spot for SiteScan in due diligence. So you're already doing an initial site visit, and at that point, the flight can be conducted during the site visit. Um, your less complicated flights, like a parking lot, can take minutes, and of course, more complicated flights, like a natural amphitheater, can take hours, um, but with a high-quality data output, um, and still done within one day, whereas other tools might take longer. Um, the processing all happens in the 3DR cloud, so we'll walk through a demo, but you're going to be collecting imagery and then sending data to the 3D cloud so that when you get back to your office later in the day, you can already start using that data for processing and an analysis. Um, so we're going to pause for one second, and we're going to open a poll that you guys can answer in the next few minutes. And one thing we want to ask you is how do you currently collect data during the due diligence or scoping phase of a project. So you can check all that apply um, and to go ahead and take, some, take a minute or two to answer the question. Um, I'm going to move on while you guys are answering. Um, and we're going to talk about the overall workflow with uh, SiteScan. So as we discussed, the first step is collecting the data um, it's as simple as drawing a, a box or creating a bounding box around the area you want to survey and then swiping to take off, um, just like you would unlock an iPhone. Um, the second step is processing the imagery. With SiteScan, you're getting unlimited processing. Um, it's creating uh, georeference ortho mosaic imagery, DEMs, 3D point clouds, and 3D meshes. Uh, as well, we just released a feature that will create contour lines automatically for you. Um, then it's super well integrated with Autodesk tools, um, like John was saying. So there we'll walk through how to create uh, the design surface in Autodesk tools. Um, but once again, you can either download the data you need to create the surface from the 3DR cloud, and we also are well integrated with A360 with Autodesk cloud, so you can download from there as well. Um, from here, we're going to move to a video. Um, so if you guys can see the video I'm sharing right now, we'll get going. And I'm going to skip through this demo a little bit, but I just want to give you a sense. So right now we're going to be doing a survey. So you have the option to inspect, scan, and survey. Here you're drawing a box around the area you want to survey. In this case, we're uh, in the Bay Area. We're not at Red Rocks. Um, and then automatically, a lawnmower flight plan is, uh, is set up for you. You get to choose your resolution, which is based on altitude. Um, and then, once again, you're sliding to take off. The drone takes off itself. It flies to the first point on the map. You can track where it's starting and where it's going to take the photos. Um, you can have a split screen so you can see both the uh, drone and the photos they're taking and the flight path. path. Um, so then after it starts to fly, you can see the photos being taken. We're going to skip to complete the end of the flight, um, as fun as it is to watch an area. Uh, we'll show you what happens next. <laughs> well, let me skip. There we go. So there the drone is landing itself. Um, 
your then completed survey. So you're able to see, um, you have to geotag the photos. Um, in this case, with the GoPro device, you're plugging in your SD card. In the future, it's going to wirelessly geotag with no additional steps. Um, then you're going to want to upload those photos to the cloud. You can see your flight plan. You can see that box where you can check upload images. Um, your images are uploaded to the 3DR cloud where it's processed and the data is turned into um, the imagery that you expect to see. And then moving on, once you get back to your office, you have your process data. You can check in the web viewer, the site scan manager, um, to see your process jobs. And then from there, you can see those download options in the bottom right-hand corner. Those are the types of formats you have that are auto-created for you. This is also, um, even though we showed a survey, this is a scan. So it's a 3D model of one given uh, object of the site, um, which is another option. Since we're talking about design surfaces, today we'll focus on. Um, the surveys. So I am going to flip back to our slideshow. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about the next step, which is taking that imagery and turning it into a design surface that you can use in Autodesk. Thank you, Lauren. That was an awesome demo. Um, that, and I think the important point to point out here is that this was this Red Rocks project was a a real live demonstration of that process that Lauren just walked through. We used that exact workflow um, to scan the nearly 150 acres at, of Red Rocks Park um, and collect a bunch of different a bunch of different scans. Um, and combine that with our terrestrial LIDAR to produce an overall model. So to get that data um, from the, the cloud into a working surface, the first step, um, I'm going to walk through a little bit of a technical um, process here. So uh, just bear with me. I think it will be useful for the engineers and the designers in the audience. But the first step to actually be able to use that data is download the .rcs file, which is the Autodesk recap scan file. Um, from Site Scan Manager. Um, so moving on from there, once you have the .rcs file um, and the .rcp file, which is the um, Autodesk Recap project file, which encapsulates all the scans, once you have those two files, you basically have a couple of op options. Optionally, you can preview and edit the RCP file in Recap if you desire. So that's just simply a matter of opening up Recap open up the .rcp file that you have stored locally on your computer, and you are able to view and edit that in Recap, as you see the screenshot here of our point cloud uh, for Red Rocks Park. That's particularly the amphitheater and surrounding rocks. So within Recap, you can make any edits, you can preview, kind of fly around the model, and get a feel for any area that you might want to focus on for uh, preliminary design. Moving on from there, just want to point out in on the right hand side of the recap um, recap screen, there's a layer viewer that that shows us all of the um, that shows us all of the uh, scans that were included in this large model of the of the park, and we're really just going to focus in on the use case of how do we take this data for just the parking lot and get it into a working surface? Um, so I just want to point out, overall, the model that's seen in these images does contain the terrestrial LIDAR and um, data from photogrammetry. Um, as we move into just the parking lot, we're just going to be utilizing photogrammetry data. So moving on from there, we're going to basically identify an area of the model that we want to focus on. In this case, it's the gravel parking lot, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the image that you see there. We're going to, in recap, just identify the specific scan, the .rcs file associated with just that area, and that's the RCS file that we're going to use in Civil 3D. So moving on from there, the next step is how do we get that RCS file into Civil 3D? Um, in Civil 3D, we're going to open up a new drawing file, a .dwg, 
we're going to basically navigate to the insert ribbon and find the tools, the Autodesk tools that are already built in for processing point clouds. So you'll find the point, point cloud tab, um, and we're going to find the attach button. And I just want to point out here, there's also an Autodesk recap button there. And just as an FYI, that button um, effectively does the same thing as we just did manually, opens up the, the point cloud within recap and allows you to edit and kind of navigate through it. Um, but for now, we're just going to click on the attach button and um, we're going to drop down to find the .rcs file that's stored locally on our um, computer. And we're going to, um, back then, if you hit OK on that screen, it'll bring up the attach point cloud dialog box, which allows you to uh, set some settings. Um, one of them would be geolocation um, settings for the point cloud. Um, and then at this point, you're just going to hit OK and move on to the next screen, which shows the point cloud um, inserted into our Civil 3D drawing file. Um, the, blue, the blue box that you see surrounding it is just a bounding box um, for our point cloud. Um, the next thing I want to talk about as we move on is to how do we kind of make this this large data set, this point cloud, more usable. We really just want to focus in on the parking lot. Um, so what we're going to do, and there's a couple different ways to manage this kind of data. I'm just going to illustrate one of those ways. What we're going to do is we're going to go up and use the um, the cropping features to select to essentially select either using a bounding box or um, just by freehand the area of the model, so just the parking lot that we want to focus on. And that's what you see in that image there with the, the white lines surrounding the gravel parking lot. Um, once you've selected that, you'll just hit OK. And um, moving on to the next slide there, we show an image of what that uh, particular parking lot model looks like after the rest of the larger point cloud model has been hidden. Um, this just makes it, again, a little bit more user-friendly as we try to focus in on this parking lot. So then we really get to the meat of this tutorial, and that is how we create a tin surface from the parking lot point cloud. Um, really, uh, there are some good tools built in, and I'm just going to highlight one way to do this. If you navigate to the Toolbox tab within your tool space in Civil 3D, um, there is a subscription extension manager that you can find. Um, and you can hit the Autodesk Point Cloud Surface Extraction Tool. I've highlighted those there in yellow on the left-hand side. Again, this is in the Settings tab within Toolspace. Once you double-click on that, it brings up a couple of dialog boxes that allow you to step through the settings for creating a tin surface from the Point Cloud. Um, you'll just select the Point Cloud. Um, you'll enter in a name, a style, um, any kind of other render material settings that you want, and then you'll hit Next. Um, the next step is to um, select the filter method that you want. And for the purposes of this example, we're just going to select the, the basic planar average filter um, just for demonstration purposes. There are some more complicated options that you can choose that um, make the surface a little bit more difficult to work with. Um, so we're just going to hit planar average, and then we're going to hit the Create Surface button. Um, the next slide shows what the result is. And that result is a tin surface of just the area of the model that we want to focus on. And that's shown in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, the green that you see is the tin surface itself. And that's, again, kind of shown from a different angle on the bottom image there. And then in the upper right-hand corner, that's just an image showing the overall 3D Point Cloud model that we do have and just the portion of it, uh, the parking lot with the surface shown. That's the area that we want to focus on. So, again, this is the most basic uh, elementary walkthrough of how you take drone data that you may have collected in the same day, perhaps, and get that to a starting point for analyzing um, things within Civil 3D. So it's a very technical, uh, but I hope practical, walkthrough of the process to create a working surface in Civil 3D from drone images. Um, this particular demonstration where we focus on just that parking lot was 
produced only from photogrammetry. Um, we did not use terrestrial LIDAR in that particular example. Um, and so I hope that was a useful walkthrough for, for those of you who are just becoming familiar with this and trying to understand how you actually utilize drone data. So now I'm going to kind of um, turn to uh, a summary that I hope will pull together the big picture of the benefits of this workflow that we've presented today and then uh, hopefully round out our presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Bobby. Thanks, John. Um, so where do we go from here? <clears throat> As you've seen, uh, by using this technology, specifically 3DR in conjunction with Autodesk, we get a much better due diligence, faster flights, and um, at a lower cost as a result. Um, but some of the things that we're looking into now uh, beyond this are 3D printing straight out of Remake, Autodesk's Remake product. Um, we're also exploring using the data to create a fully interactive experience that will allow visitors to see some of the hidden gems. Um, and stay tuned because there's much more below this surface that's pretty exciting. Um, uh, through the use of visualization tools like 3D Studio Max, uh, we're going to be using photometrics to augment the lighting design for the concerts. Right now, they use a pretty uh, archaic way of doing that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to augment that process. Uh, creating drop analytics for uh, water runoff analysis. Um, and the cur current model has provided a really good baseline for all future flights that we plan on doing to ascertain storm runoff, erosion on the trail system in the parking lots. So we'll be able to go out after a storm, recollect data, and compare the two to see what kind of uh, damage has been done. Um, this has also allowed us to identify nesting areas for some of the several species of birds of prey that live out there, because um, you can literally see the fouling that is created from the nests, and in some cases, the actual birds of prey. Um, actually, there's a, there's a short little story segue. Remember that bird that actually almost dive-bombed the drone during the <laughs> yeah. flight? Um, we've also been able to use the ortho imagery to assist in the identification identification of plant material, um, some of the man-made structures for roof inspections. So, I mean, the list goes on. So stay tuned to be continued. And um, I think at this time, Lauren, we could probably open it up for questions. Thanks, Bobby. And thanks for going over all the different use cases in addition to the design surface uh, using drones. So um, we're going to open it up for Q&A right now. We have uh, collected some of the questions that have been asked during the presentation um, via chat, and you're welcome to ask more. Um, so I think the first one is for um, John or Bobby. Um, what resolution data do you prefer or need for planning specifically? Yeah, it's a very good question, and um, one of the things that I maybe did not specifically touch on in the presentation was um, when you are looking at a certain project, you really need to identify what is the most appropriate um, workflow for that particular project. And a lot of times, drone collection of data might not be needed. Um, but for many of our projects, when we're looking at initial preliminary design or we're just doing due diligence on a site, some of the times we, we're not able to pull from the high resolution imagery available online certain surface features um, that you, you wouldn't otherwise be able to see unless you were physically out on site um, and collecting that data. So it really just depends on the project, and I think that's a very important point as more and more people in both construction and engineering and on the design side start to look at utilizing drone data. You have to really understand that it's not to be used in every situation, just like any other tool, but in many situations it is very, very useful. So when it comes to the, the resolution um, of data, it really depends on the project. But um, like I said, we're using the, the 20 megapixel uh, camera on the, the Solo, and um, from an average flight altitude of, I would say, 150 feet, we're really able to hone in on 
you know, any features that we that we really want to see. And it really helps us to cut down on uh, rework and, and problems that would otherwise arise. Okay, so our next question um, is, can you measure distances in the 3D model and what software or softwares can you use to do that? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a very practical question, and one of the it's at, it's really at the heart of of what we do on a day to day basis, and why we wanted to do this webinar to get um, more and more people aware of the fact that you can take same day data and get it into a software product that we already use and do things like measure distances. So to answer the question directly, yes, you can measure distances both in, in the point cloud in recap and also within uh, Civil 3D. So um, just like any other um, workflow where you would get a traditional survey into Civil 3D and begin design from there, once you have the point cloud data within Civil 3D, you can, you can do all of those types of exercises. A re recap, <clears throat> 3D Studio Max, just to add to the list, InfraWorks, that'll allow you to bring that stuff in and measure it. Okay, and then the next question is, can you redefine uh, ground sampling distance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so ground, ground sampling distance is essentially the to put it very basically, the, the number of pixels um, or the distance per pixel in an image, okay? So you're, you're looking at every pixel within the images that are collected from an aerial drone at say 150 feet of altitude and you're, you're looking at how many, how much your measurement distance is within each of those pixels. So it's an indicator or a factor that plays into the accuracy um, and like I said before, the, the the kind of prevailing thought or the, the patterns, the trends that we're seeing are that the ground sampling distance has only been improving over the last couple of years as technology improves and you get closer and closer to better accuracy based on that. Um, it's just more data within a single image. And um, yeah. Okay, and um, for the Red Rocks example, did you include oblique images in addition to Nader or Nadir? <laughs> yep, we absolutely did. And that was a really interesting part of the project. Um, we flew a lot of um, Nadir flight, pla flight plans. We collected a lot of photos. That's what the, the model, I would say, is primarily based on, but there are a lot of really, really interesting rock formations within Red Rocks Park that we wanted to capture and have that information in incorporated into the model. And I think that's a really, really important part of this particular site. Um, when you talk about the proof of concept and so forth, we've been able to get into and explore some of those areas that might be undersides of rocks, they might be caves, they might be um, just certain geologic features or even just certain um, features within the amphitheater itself such as the underside of the, the, the stage canopy mm -hmm. um, where we've been able to gather oblique images and include or incorporate those into the model to really produce um, a complete model. Okay, and um, we're only going to have time to get to about two more questions. Um, one really good question that I think I can answer here is, what do you get with SiteScan? Because we talked about using a few different pieces of software. So with SiteScan, you're getting unlimited processing. So you don't need any credits. You can process as many images as you want and create as many data products as you want. Um, while you're using SiteScan. You're also getting unlimited storage. You're getting data management via the SiteScan manager, that web application we showed you. You're getting success services, which includes engineering support. It also includes a replacement drone. Um, so if you're getting solo, when you're getting solo through um, SiteScan, um, we will replace one drone um, and uh, 
in, on, nine, on September 1st, the drone will include uh, the Sony R10C, which is the lens and the camera we used for um, the Red Rocks project. Um, and then there was, yeah, I'm being reminded that we also use the GoPro for the Red Rocks example as well. Um, and that's another option that you can get um, with Solo. Okay, and then, oh, uh, good question for you, John. What version of Civil 3D were you using in the example? In this particular example, we were using 2013, I believe. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the, the functionality worked very well. Okay, so I think that's all we have time for. Go ahead and leave some more questions. We'll see if we missed anything um, big that we can get to via our follow-up email. We've recorded a part of this webinar, at least the questions in the end part, so we'll send that out to everyone as well. Um, and then we also wanted to announce that we know uh, Monday, August 29th is a big date in the drone world because uh, the Part 107 rule will go into effect. So that's the FAA rule saying that you no longer need to be a professional pilot in order to fly a drone legally. Now you simply have to take a uh, exam at an FAA test center um, to uh, be able to fly a drone legally. So it's a pretty exciting time for us over here at 3DR. We're all preparing ourselves for the exam. We've put some study content, some practice exams, and a locator for drone test centers at 3dr.com slash FAA. And next week at our webinar, we will have some special guests including a pilot uh, instructor who's taught uh, many students for pilot exams, FAA exams in the past, helping us prepare for Part 107, and then also some stories from people who have actually taken Part 107, um, or who will have taken Part 107 by August 29th. So look out for the invitations for that, um, and let us know if you have any questions via the Q&A panel. Thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you all. And thank you so much to Bobby and John's awesome content. Yes, thank you very much, Lauren, and 3DR, and Autodesk as well. It's been a great project, and we look forward to uh, talking, more uh, talking more about it as we yeah. develop more of the work products. All right. Have a great day, everybody.